My friend says it cuts taxes for almost everybody. The last tax proposal you brought up here gave as much in tax breaks to the richest one-tenth of one percent, those people who are millionaires, as to the bottom 89 percent of the people. Does my friend think that's fair? Well, I, I uh, thank my friend for his question. And what I will say is, uh, frankly, as we look at the numbers, one percent of the American people provide 37 percent of the tax revenues that are paid in this country, but the rich and 5 percent of the American taxpayers provide over 52 percent of the yield? tax revenues. I'm not going to yield at this point because okay. I'm trying to make a point, and okay. I wanted to I, yield I to the question, and I've responded to, the, to my friend's question. What I wanted to say is, and, and uh, I, I will say it again, this measure, Mr. Speaker, will cut taxes for virtually every American who pays taxes. And let me say that I am so excited about the fact that it cuts taxes not only for those job creators by dramatically increasing expensive, for expensing for small businesses, by bringing about the kinds of uh, increased appreciation, which is very important and necessary, but also I'm enthused about cutting the top rate on the capital gains tax. I'm very privileged to have worked for years and years and years here. In fact, I've got a bipartisan, bicameral, zero capital gains tax caucus. And guess what? This measure creates a zero capital gains, not for those who are in the highest income tax brackets, not for those who are out there creating huge numbers of jobs, but this measure will, in the year 2008, establish a zero capital gains tax rate for whom? For those who are in the 10 percent tax bracket, those who are in the 15 percent tax bracket. And, Mr. Speaker, it also provides a zero tax in the year 2008 for those who have dividend income. And there are many Americans who fall in that category. So we are achieving, with passage of this measure, a zero capital gains rate for those who are at the lowest end of the economic spectrum. And yes, we are in fact cutting it for those in the higher end as well. We're cutting it from 20 percent to 15 percent. And we also know as we look at the broad cross-section of the American people who are going to be benefited by this, uh, expanding and making permanent the marriage tax penalty. That relief is very, very important. And also expanding the child credit up to $1,000, another very important provision which will be helpful, helpful to middle-income wage earners in this country. And so while I hear this measure described by my friend from Texas as the, you know, only benefiting millionaires, that is an absolutely preposterous description of this very important legislation. And I also have to say, Mr. Speaker, that I'm very proud of the fact that we've stepped forward acknowledging that there are real challenges that our states are facing. My state of California has tragically a $38.2 billion deficit. And what is it that we do in this measure? We step up to the plate and provide $20 billion in assistance for those states, those states that have come to us and talked about the very important needs that they face. And so, Mr. Speaker, I'm convinced that we have done the right thing. We are going to lay the groundwork to provide a tax De de a defined effort to create jobs and growth in this country. This measure deserves strong bipartisan support. Uh, the President of the United States stood here in this Capitol and this morning said he looks forward to signing this bill. And while it's not exactly what we'd wanted from the beginning, we've said that we're excited about the fact that the argument has been over what the size of the tax cut will be. Because we know that when our friends on the other side of the aisle were in the majority, the debate was so often over what the size of the tax increase would be. And we've all heard the lines about the desire to keep these dollars in the pockets of the American people because they've earned them. We all know that that's the case. But we also have to realize that these proposals that have come forward from the other side of the aisle to increase taxes, which is the proposal that we had last week that came from that side, would do nothing to create jobs and encourage economic growth. In fact, 
as my friend from New York has just so eloquently said, it would have exacerbated, exacerbated the economic challenges that we've faced. The downturn began in the last two quarters of the year 2000. That's before George Bush was elected President of the United States. Since that time, this nation has faced all three of the factors that the President outlined in his campaign that indicated that he possibly would have to lead into deficit spending. War, recession, national emergency. No one needs to have September 11th uh, redefined for them. We all lived through that right here in the Capitol, and tragically, so many of us lost friends on that day. We also have just gone through a war liberating the people of Iraq. And we know that it's been very costly. We also know that as we've looked at this deficit, the real problem that we face is the fact that we have seen a slow economy. And how is it that we're going to generate the revenues to deal with these very important priorities that we have? It's to generate a flow of revenues that we need. And we all know that every single time we've cut the top rate on capital gains, I'm happy to yield. I'm just curious, as a member of the body and as a voter, when does it become Mr. Bush's economy? Can you give me one? Because you said this started back when Bill Clinton was in office, and I yield back. But when does it become well, I, well, President my, Bush's economy? I thank, my, I thank my friend for his question. That's a very good question. And I think that what I've basically said is this downturn began in the last two quarters of 2000. I didn't say whose economy this is or isn't. I would say that we're all in this together as the American people. We all together stood outside the Capitol as members of this body following the tragedy of September 11th. We've all been faced with the challenge of the war with Iraq. We've all been faced with a downturn that began then, and we've been in, in the last two quarters of 2000, and we are struggling to emerge. We're struggling to get this economy back on track. That's why the measure that we passed in 2001, which my friend from New York, Mr. Reynolds, was talking about, did play a role in mitigating the economic downturn. Virtually every economist indicated, had we not passed that measure, the problems would have been worse than they are today. And I believe that passage of this measure will go a long way towards creating the kind of revenue flow that we need. Because as I was saying, every single time we have cut the top rate on capital gains, we've seen an increase of the flow of revenues to the federal treasury. When John F. Kennedy did it, when Ronald Reagan did it, we doubled the flow of revenues to the Treasury during the 1980s when Ronald Reagan brought about that reduction. In fact, we saw a 500 percent increase in the flow of revenues when the top rate on capital gains was reduced from 28 percent to 20 percent in 1981. Unfortunately, in the 1986 tax bill, we saw that rate go back up. That 500 percent increase in the flow of revenues that came by unleashing unleashing that uh, potential that was there. Unfortunately, we saw a diminution of it once we increased that rate. So I'm convinced, Mr. Speaker, that we are going to observe a dramatic increase in the flow of revenues to the federal treasury once we put into place this measure that cuts for most Americans the rate from 20 to 15 percent, and for those in the 10 to 15 percent bracket, reduces it to a great big zero. And I, when I think about those who are at the lower end of the spectrum, I think about those individuals who are starting their businesses, maybe have a home that is appreciated. They want to be able to have the chance to create jobs and get onto that first rung of the economic ladder. This measure is one that is designed to create the opportunity for people to do just that. This is a very good start. It's a good piece of legislation. I'm very proud of the work that's been done by Mr. Thomas and the Ways and Means Committee, our colleagues and the other body, and of course President Bush in providing stellar leadership for this, and of course Speaker Hastert as well, who has constantly pushed in the direction of trying to reduce that burden well, the imposed on the American one, people. More. And with that, what I'm going to do, I was happy to yield to my friend before, I'm going to yield back to my friend from New York, and I know that on the other side of the aisle, Mr. Frost is very generous with his allotment of time, and I'm sure I don't he'll want to be say, able to yield to I was just going to, to ask you a question about Thanks. the debt and when does that stuff begin to matter, but I'll, I'll, I'll raise it on my side. Texas. I'm happy to wait here, and if you want to pose it to me sure. later. Gentleman from Texas. Um, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 
uh, such time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, I've been listening to my friend uh, from California. It's a very interesting uh, description of the bill. Uh, I've got uh, a table here, Table 5.1, Conference Agreement on Jobs and Growth Tax Relief Reconciliation Act of 2003. This table has some very interesting information in it. If you make a million dollars or more, you get $93,530 of tax cuts on the average. Now, if you make between $20,000 and $30,000 a year, you get 15 bucks a month. No, no, 15 bucks a month. And if you make between 30 and $40,000, you get a little bit less than 30 bucks a month. Would the gentleman yield? No, no, no I, I, let, me, let me just comment that uh, the gentleman is trying to say that, oh, this is a wonderful thing for people in the lower income brackets. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I should suggest to you that the great spread here of $93,530 for the millionaires and $15 a month for the fella or woman making between twenty dollars and $30,000 and less than $20, $30 a month for the family of thirty dollars to $40,000 uh, I'm not sure uh, what the gentleman is trying to sell here. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be I, happy to yield. I thank my friend for yielding. And I, I'd like to ask my friend, does he propose that that American who is earning between twenty dollars and $40,000 a year, does he propose that they receive a $93,000 tax cut? Is no, that, I, is I, that what the reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. I'm just uh, proposing that we not try and tell them that they're getting a really good deal here that they're getting, well, they a big getting a they're, deal. they're getting a really big tax cut because the people they're who are getting, getting the really deal. big tax cut are the folks who are the millionaires and the average folks out there are just getting a little bit. Um, Mr. Speaker, I yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings. Gentleman's recognized. I ask our permission to revise and extend Without my objection. remarks. I would like to say to the distinguished uh, chairman uh, that that last quarter that he talked about in 2000, the tax measure had not been passed at that time, actually did not pass until June of 2001. I would also like to say to my friend, the chairman, who said, and I quote, that he's proud to be a Republican. He was born uh, to cut taxes, my good friend Mr. Dreyer said. Well, I'm proud to be a Democrat, and I was born to help those who cannot help themselves. When you talk about people that uh, uh, pay taxes receiving benefits, there are people in this country who want to pay taxes but can't get a job. Now, Mr. Speaker, do my colleagues realize that this body will spend a meager two hours uh, debating this tax cut? That is, uh, the House will dish out more than $2.4 billion to America's wealthiest for every minute it has debated this irresponsible proposal. Let me repeat myself for those who did not hear me the first time. $2.4 billion per minute of debate. Mark Twain uh, said that there are two things you should never watch being made, sausage and legislation. The development of the Republican tax cut plan exemplifies the similarities between the nastiness and randomness of sausage making and lawmaking. Those on the other side of the aisle have dismembered competing packages into a speculative $318 billion collage. The tax cut conference report is incomprehensible, politically motivated, and fiscally irresponsible. Outside these hallowed halls is a visitor center that's much needed that's being built. Right now, all it is is a big old hole. And what the Republicans are proposing is a $1 trillion hole that is a great metaphor for that big old hole that's right out here outside. This ugly tax sausage is the product of the President's and Republican majority's troubling tax cut fixation. The tax cut conference report is a collection of various misplaced, 
gruesome, and dishonest provisions. The Frankenstein result is an offensive tax cut proposal with no legs to stand on, no eyes to see beyond the present, no voice of truth, and no heart with compassion for America's neediest. For President Bush and the Republican majority, tax cuts are a one-size-fits-all solution. Last year's obese, obtuse, and downright obnoxious tax cut was, according to the majority, correct for the then existing surplus. This year, while the economy is ailing, the President, House Majority, and Senate Majority all have professed that their own version of a tax cut plan will solve the current economic problems. Now we are being asked to subscribe to the untruthful claim that this fifth tax cut version, more mangled and distorted. May I have an additional 30 seconds? I ask uh, that members do not support this bigger the wallet, bigger the benefit rule and tax proposal. Gentleman from New York. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're getting to the heart of it. The heart of it is that the left is filing in here to talk about we need bigger government. We need more spending. We need more of that central federal government. And the debate will happen after this rule is passed of those who want to see a tax cut, those who want to put that money back in the American people's pocket. And then we'll begin to look at some of the facts in this debate. I will not yield. A married couple with two children, an income of $40,000, will see their taxes decline under the Jobs and Growth Tax Relief Bill of $1,133 in 2003, a decline of 96%. In 2003, 91 million taxpayers will receive on average a tax cut of $1,126 under the Jobs and Growth Act of 2003. 68 million women will see their taxes decline on average by $1,338. 45 million Married couples will receive an average tax cut of $1,786. 34 million families with children will benefit from an average tax cut of $1,549. 6 million single women with children will receive an average tax cut of $558. 12 million elderly taxpayers will receive an average tax cut of $1,401. 23 million small business owners will receive tax cuts averaging $2,209. I will not yield. 3 million individuals and families. I want you to listen to this for those who wonder what we're doing on tax cuts. 3 million individuals and families will have their income tax liability completely eliminated by this act. I'll repeat that again. Three million individuals and families will have their income tax liability completely eliminated by this act. Half of the tax relief package in 2003 is directed to the child tax credit, expanding a 10% bracket, eliminating the marriage penalty, accelerating the marginal rate cuts, and ensuring the middle class families do not face AMT. 10 million seniors will receive some type of dividend income, will be able to make their golden years more secure by keeping more of what their dividend income is. Ladies and gentlemen, when I have this vote cast for this rule, and then when I vote on the underlying legislation, I am happy to take those facts back to my district and stand before them. Do you want more federal government and a bureaucrat to create your program, or do you want that money in your pocket for you to make that decision? Now I'll yield to the gentleman if he's still here. I thank my friend for yielding. I appreciate that. For a point of a question. Here's my question. The Wall Street Journal poll today showed massive opposition to this tax proposal and that more than half of the American people, 55 percent, said they would prefer the government. Let me finish. If the government question, to spend sir, more on money time. on health care coverage. The people want health care. They want Social Security. My friend, respond to that. Speaker. I also saw a poll that says that the American people want a tax cut, and quite frankly, as the President traveled the country in the week that uh, we were on recess, he raised the polling numbers for that tax cut by 10 percent. But he's still losing. The t polls are very clear. The people want health care and Social Security. 
Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 30 seconds. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, I've been listening to the gentleman, and uh, the gentleman from New York, and of course, he, he offers a false choice. He says, do you want tax cuts or do you want bigger government? Uh, the people that I talk to don't want a government that puts them in debt. They, they don't want their children and grandchildren to be paying, having to bail out the country for this tax cut that's being passed this year because of the size of the debt that this is causing. No, they don't necessarily want bigger government, but they don't want that debt hanging over, the, over their children and grandchildren for several generations. Mr. Speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Spratt. The gentleman's recognized. Speaker, I have to wonder if our good friend from New York, when he tells his constituents about their benefits, will tell them that the child tax credit will expire in 2004, the 10 percent bracket expansion will expire in 2004, the AMT exemption, the marital mitigation provision will expire in a year. We give with one hand and take away almost immediately with the next. The sun rises and the sun sets. Let me dispel, first of all, one myth about this tax bill, the myth that the President's putting out that this is an itty-bitty tax bill. $350 billion by itself would not be itty-bitty, particularly when you have a deficit, as we do. But this is not a $350 billion tax bill. If you assume, as we must, that these sunsets are a sham, and why shouldn't we? Because the architects of this bill are all saying they'll be extended. We just put them in there to shoehorn this thing into the budget. If you assume that, then this is what this total tax cut will be. Not $350 billion, but in the next 10 years, $1 trillion. That's the result. And since the budget is now in deficit, all of this amount, all trillion dollars, $1 trillion, will go to the bottom line and will swell the deficit. That means we'll have a deficit this year, a record deficit of $425 billion, and the deficit will hover in that range, ratcheted at that range of three to $400 billion for as far out as we forecast. But we don't stop here because Republicans have told us proudly that they're going to make tax cuts an annual event. And if you look in their budget, you see there are more unreconciled tax cuts still on back burner yet to be brought forward. And if you look in the President's budget, you'll see that there are a lot of tax cuts left on the cutting room floor waiting there for the next round. Here are three known tax cuts that are yet to come off the agenda. First of all, we all know the tax cuts passed in 01 have to be made permanent, will be made permanent by a majority if it stays the majority of this House. That'll cost six to six hundred billion dollars, six to six hundred and fifty billion dollars in revenues. Second, there's another two to three hundred billion dollars of various tax cuts lying on the cutting room floor waiting for the next round. Third, there's the alternative minimum tax. We all know that politically it has to be fixed in the next 10 years or else 25 million Americans are going to pay much higher taxes than they now pay. They'll pay the alternative minimum tax. The cost of fixing it is reasonably $650 to $680 billion. Now, if you add all of these tax cuts together and make a few modest adjustments for the likely cost of defense and homeland security and Medicare prescription drugs, let me tell you, here are the results. And I've got a piece of paper, and I'm going to leave it here on the desk. We've calculated them on this sheet of paper. If anybody takes exception with them, come down here and refute it. Here are the results per our reckoning of what's going to happen to the budget. First, from 2004 until 2013, deficits will total, get this, deficits will total $3,959,000,000,000. Second, from 2004, could I have an additional minute, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Ranking Member? 30 seconds. We'll give you one more minute. One minute. Without Social Security, deficits will total $6,527,000,000,000. Debt held by the public will increase from $3.5 billion trillion to $7.9 trillion. Total statutory debt will go up to $14 trillion. Now, you can overlook and dispute a lot of these facts, but there are two facts you can't dispute. They won't go away. First of all, 77 million baby boomers are marching to their retirement. And they're going to double the number of beneficiaries on Social Security and Medicare, and those programs won't sustain their benefits in the current situation. Secondly, what you sow, 
our children and their children are going to reap. They'll have to support the underfunded Social Security program, the underfunded Medicare program. They'll have to bear the burden of $14 trillion in statutory debt that you are incurring as you move down this path tonight. That's the course you choose. That's the moral decision you make tonight if you vote for these tax cuts. If you do it in the name of creating jobs, let me tell you, I don't think this is going to create that many jobs. With one exception, I'll grant you, it's going to create a lot of jobs for tax lawyers and accountants. This bill will be a bonanza for those who specialize in tax avoidance, and the real cost, believe me, is going to be beyond calculation. Gentleman from New York. Mr. Speaker, I stated a number of facts of how many millions of Americans benefit from this plan. I realize it was my party that started the graphs and bringing those uh, very scientific presentations before us. I respect listening to the gentleman as he brought some of those today, but there are two important messages that I know I have been taught and trained by my constituents when I go home each week that's drilled into my uh, graph of my mind and my views here. One is keep and create jobs. That's what this bill does. The other is tax cuts now. And that's what we're going to have the opportunity to vote on. And there's going to be great debate after this rule on the Thomas uh, tax bill that he will present. But the reality is, at the end of the day, we're going to pass that legislation. We're going to help people go back to work. And we've also done some unimportant things with the unemployment insurance today. We're moving forward. It's a good Bush agenda. It's an agenda that the American people want, and they're going to have it. I reserve the balance of my time. I'm from Texas. The speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders. The gentleman's recognized. I thank my friend for yielding. Mr. Speaker, this bill is a fraud. It will do devastating harm to this country. It is an embarrassment that the Republican leadership brings it up, and it should be defeated. Mr. Speaker, point number one, this bill is grossly unfair. My Republican friends, it is not the millionaires and billionaires who are struggling. It's the middle class. It is working families who are struggling. And yet, your bill gives $93,000 a year in tax breaks to the millionaires. But 36% of the American people get nothing, and 53% of the households would receive a tax cut of under $100. So the people who, help, who need the help get nothing. The millionaires get the lion's share. Number two, when you give hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks, you endanger the middle class. This will lead to drastic cutbacks in education, in Medicare, in Medicaid, in Head Start, in the programs that working families depend upon. Shame, cutting back on education and Head Start to give tax breaks to billionaires. Number three, what a legacy to leave to our children and grandchildren. The national debt now is almost $6 trillion. Huge debt payments every single year. Your tax breaks for the rich will drive the national debt up by several trillion dollars. What a gift to give to our grandchildren. Fourth point, you talk about creating jobs. That's what you told us two years ago when you brought forth your tax breaks for the rich. You told America it was going to create jobs. In the last two years, we have lost two million jobs after your tax breaks for the rich. This proposal will do nothing more. If you want to create decent paying jobs, build affordable housing. Protect workers right now who will lose their jobs at the state and city levels. Tax breaks for the rich do not create jobs. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, the American people are seeing through this fraud. The Wall Street Journal NBC poll says today nearly two-thirds 64% of the people who were polled said there were better ways to boost the economy than tax cuts. Only 29% said tax cuts were the answer. More than half, these guys say big government, terrible, terrible. What you're really saying is you don't want the elderly to have prescription drugs. You don't want the kids to have an education. That's what you mean when you rant and rave against big government. But here's what the people say. 55% said 
they would prefer the government to spend more money on providing health care coverage compared to 36% who said no. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.